playing all cards. A copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Calling all cards, attention all cards, attention all Yuma County Sheriff's cards. Broadcast 133, a missing person report. Jack Hayden and Ralph Hart, prospectors, are missing from their ranch near Bouse. That's all. Tonight's crime occurred in Arizona, that land of wide open spaces, of long desert roads. Law enforcement officers cover great distances in their cars, so the gasoline they use must consistently produce greater mileage. Speed and power, too, are important. From the Sheriff's Office of Maricopa County, the largest county in Arizona, comes this statement. We've tried a lot of different gasolines. Last year, we decided Rio Grande Cracked was the gasoline that gave us the greatest mileage, so we specified it exclusively for all Maricopa County emergency cars. A year's use proved that Rio Grande Cracked was not only the most economical gasoline we could buy, but was also faster and more powerful. So this year, we've renewed our contract. So in Arizona's largest county, wherein reside approximately half the population of that great state, we find convincing evidence that Rio Grande cracked gasoline is more economical per mile. And in the congested traffic of big cities like Los Angeles, Oakland, Berkeley, we find police in emergency cars using Rio Grande cracked because it is the fastest, most powerful gasoline money can buy. Every motorist who will make a test will discover the reason why Rio Grande Cracked powers more emergency cars wherever it is sold than any other brand. It is because Rio Grande Cracked never fails to give smoother, faster, and more miles for your money. And now it is our great pleasure to welcome to Calling All Cars... Sheriff T.H. Newman of Yuma County, Arizona. Sheriff Newman. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm honored that tonight the Yuma County Sheriff's Office joins the distinguished list of law enforcement bodies to exploit have been selected by calling all cars for radio dram dramatization. The territory which we patrol in Yuma County is indeed the rugged, but not quite so wild west. We are equipped with the most modern type of law enforcement equipment, fast cars, teletype, record bureau, and so on. But when we encounter a crime such as the one we're about which you will hear in a moment, then it is the backcountry work and doesn't differ much from the kind of work the gun-toting sheriffs of the old days were called upon to perform. It isn't strange, however, that crimes such as this are... Ones are encountered by eastern criminals who will think they are can hop in a car or on a horse or in an automobile and disappear over the hills, just as they have seen in this in the movies. This is no longer so, for we have automobiles too. And there is the telephone and the telegraph, speeding the message of their crime faster than they can travel. They are playing a sucker's game, just as those boys did. No matter how rugged the country or how remote the spot, the criminal leaves his trail and the law is sworn to follow it. In the end, the criminal is bound to lose. January 1933. On a cold winter's afternoon, three men sit in the hall bedroom in a midtown rooming house in New York City. They are cheap tenderloin sports members of the legion of drifters which line Broadway's curbs, believers in the creed that only saps work. But today is too cold and slushy to ogle the ankles of chorus girls in front of the Oster. So they sit wasting the commodity of which they have an abundance, time. On the ice-strewn bed, Dan Connell and Bill Doughty play a listless game of double solitaire while Lou Douglas idly scans the morning paper in the failing afternoon light. Suddenly his eyes fall upon an item tucked away in the financial section. He snaps out of his lethargy with a jerk. Hey, you guys, get a load of this. What? A piece in the paper here. I read that paper. There ain't nothing in it. Oh, yes, there is. Listen to this. The Consolidated Quartz Corporation of America announced yesterday the purchase of the Good Hope Gold Mine from Jack Hayden, 
hard rock miner who first prospected the property 15 years ago. The Good Hope is located in Yuma County, Arizona, near Bouse. What of it? Come on, Bill. Keep your mind on the game. Wait a minute, you mugs. This is more important than that card game. I know this guy, Hayden, see? Remember when I was out in Arizona a couple of years ago? Well, I worked for him then. I repeat, what of it? Just this. Hayden told me that the mine was producing enough to give him a living. And just as soon as he hit the real pay dirt, he was going to sell out and quit. Well, he's hit pay dirt and he's sold out. So what? This. Hayden's a funny old bird with a lot of screwy ideas. And the screwiest idea he has is this. He don't trust banks. Of course I don't trust banks. I don't trust nobody with my money. I want it around where I can keep an eye on it, Ralph. Hey, where'd you ever get so sour on banks? Ever since we started mining together more than ten years ago, you had an unholy terror of banks. I don't understand you, Jack. Never had no trouble with banks myself. Well, I read the papers. I know what these high finance sharks do with other people's money. They swindle you. That's what they do. And what can you do about it? Nothing. Ah, quit talking. Have another cup of coffee. Well, all right. Yes, guess we will. Well, I got to say one thing. Ten years we've been living in this cabin out here in the desert, and I don't know yet where you keep your money hid. And you never will. It ain't safe to trust no one, not even an old friend like you when it comes to money. Well, all right, have it your own way. Wherever you hide it, it's safer than it would be in a bank. You hide it so darn good. Hey, hey, listen, Ralph. What's that? Huh? What? Hey, I thought I heard a car coming. Yeah, it does sound like it. Well, why don't you open the door and see who it is, or don't you? You expecting someone? No, I ain't expecting no one. Well, well, who is it? Well, I can't tell. Strangers, I think. Hello there. Hello. Guess you don't remember me, Lou Douglas? Lou Douglas? Well, I'll be a son of a gun. Hey, Jack, it's Douglas. Douglas? Douglas who? Hello, Jack. Where's your memory? Don't you remember back a few years I was here? No! Well, what in the world are you doing out here? I want you to meet a couple of friends of mine, engineers from Consolidated Quartz. This is Mr. Hayden and Mr. Hart, Mr. Dowdy. And this is Dan O'Connell, Mr. Hayden and Mr. Hart. Howdy, oh, oh, man. Oh. No Mr. Yet. Dowdy and Dan here want to look over the Good Hope mine. Their firm sent them out to make a few preliminary assays before they start production. Well, I'm glad to have visitors. We, we don't see many people out this way. Come on in, sit down. Thanks. Not much of a place, but I think you can find a place to sit, <laughs> if you don't mind hard chairs. Don't worry about these fellas, Hayden. They're regular. How about it, fellas? Yeah, sure. Uh, how long you figured on staying around, Mr. Dowdy? Oh, just as long as it takes us to make our investigations and such. Shouldn't be very long. Yeah, no, I didn't own the mine anymore, didn't you, Lou? I heard something about your having sold out. Must have hit it at last, eh? Yep, yep, did. Hit pay dirt and turned right around and sold out. Save all the trouble of working the mine myself. You, uh, <clears throat> you got a good price for it, Mr. Hayden? Uh, sure. <laughs> Think I would have sold it if I hadn't? Of course I got a good price for it. <laughs> I suppose you've invested your money by now. Got all over those silly ideas of yours about banks and things you used to talk about. Silly ideas? Silly up. Say what's silly about them. Say, if you come out here to sell me something, you might as well get over the idea. I ain't in the market for nothing. We don't want to sell anything. Just wondering what you've done with all your ideas, that's all. Well, you can't never tell. You might have tried to sell me something. Say, um, not to change the subject or anything, but where does one sleep around here? Is there a hotel or anything near? A hotel? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. Nearest hotel is in Bouse City, and that's 30 miles back the road. Uh, Mr. Doughty isn't used to the great outdoors. Uh, that is in this part of the world. I still want to know where we bunk. Well, if you don't mind being a little cramped, I imagine you can all put up here with us for a while. We don't want to put you to any trouble. Of course, we uh, have a store of foodstuffs, plenty to eat. Well, ain't no trouble at all. Be glad of the company, too. <laughs> And I won't have to fight with Hart all day. <laughs> and that'll be all right with me, too. If you're sure it won't be too much trouble, it'd be a great help. No, nope, no trouble at all. Well, if that's the case, what do you say we unload the car, boys? We can get a good night's sleep tonight and plan on starting for the mine early in the morning. It shouldn't take us long to get what we want. No, Willard. I don't think our job will be hard at all. Not hard at all. <laughs> Mr. 
Well pleased with the success of their first step, the three men spend the early part of the evening talking of the mine, of Hayden's luck in hitting it rich, eagerly hanging on every word the old prospector says in hopes of locating his money cash. But although Hayden is willing to talk about his success, he is careful not to make any mention of what he has done with the money. At last, weary from the day's travel, they are making preparations for bed when Hayden's nearest neighbor, Tom Dugas, returning from Bow City and seeing the lights in the cabin, stops in to say hello. Well, hello, Tom. What are you doing turning around this late at night? Well, I was coming in from the city and I saw the lights in that car out there, so I thought I'd stop and see what's going on. Yeah. You got guests? Yep, yep. Come on in and meet them. Fella used to work for me and a couple of mining engineers. Claim they want to look the old mine over. Yeah, I guess they're the same ones I passed on the road this afternoon. I was wondering who they were. Well, well, come on in, shut the door. It's getting cold. Hello. Hello, this here is Tom Dugas. Leaves down the road a piece. This is Mr. Douglas from New York. I do. Right. You, you know Hart and these two gents here are Dan O'Connell and Mr. Willard Dowdy, also in New York. Howdy, howdy, Mr. Dugas. You live around here long, Mr. Dugas? Oh, quite a while. Must be familiar with the Good Hope Mine, then, huh? Mm-hmm. You know every inch of it besides. Good. I was thinking that maybe if somebody went along with us tomorrow, it would speed matters up. Of course, we're anxious to get our report and get back to New York. Maybe you could go with us in the morning, huh? Well, I suppose it could, if it'd help any. Oh, it would. It'd be a great help. <laughs> The following morning, true to his promise, Dugas shows up at the Hayden shack and picking the three men up, starts for the mine a few miles distance. Douglas makes a trip through the mine as fast as possible, picks up a few samples of ore and throwing all the samples into one big bag returns to Hayden's. Once there, Douglas makes the excuse of talking to Hayden alone and Dugas leaves them, saying that he will return in the morning. And once he has left, Douglas calls his two cronies aside and explains his sudden hurry. I'm not sure, but I think that old coot Dugas suspects something. I didn't like the way he looked at me. Oh, uh, so we've got to find that dough and get out of here. Did you find out anything from Dugas worth knowing? No. He says that Hayden hasn't got any dough, but I know different. The only thing that's bad is that we don't know where it is, and I don't think Hayden's liable to tell us. Uh, what do we do? Tonight, after he and Hart have turned in, we'll do a little snooping. If it's in the house, maybe we can find it. And if we don't, then we stick around until we do. But that night goes by and the men find nothing. A day passes, two days, a week, and Douglas is frantic. Hayden and Hart are beginning to wonder why they don't leave, and Douglas realizes that the only way to find the money is to get the two of them away from the place long enough for a thorough search. But how to do this? Then one night, just as Douglas is about to give up, old Tom Dugas stops in to say that he's going to bounce himself. Hayden gives Dugas a list, thanks him, and says he'll be home in the morning if there's anything else. And the following morning, Dugas starts off for the city. But as he's about to pass the Hayden house, he notices an air of desertion about the place. The car is gone and the front door is locked. On closer investigation, he finds that Hayden's dog is locked inside the house, a fact that disturbs Dugas. His suspicions aroused, he returns to his car, drives to Bouse, and reports to Constable Joe Cavanaugh of the Bouse City Sheriff's Office. And you say that he never locks the dog in the house when he leaves? No, sir. He's got a long line out in front, and he always ties the dog out there. And that ain't all. I couldn't find a note on his door, and he always leaves a note, a habit he's never missed doing. What about these three men you mentioned? Do you know anything about them? Mm, nothing more than I told you, only I didn't trust any of them. Yeah, they didn't seem like mining engineers to me. Well, there's a chance that they might have all gone up the mine, of course. Tell you what you do. If you find the same condition when you get back there tonight, drive up to the Swansea mine and phone in. I'll get a couple of men and come out. Hey, it ain't going to no mine. I know it. I know good and well something's happened over there, and I don't like it. Well, you call me if you need me, and I'll come out. Meantime, there's nothing more to do. All right, Constable, I'll go back now. But you stick around here. I got a hunch you'll hear from me sooner than you expect. That night, the phone in Constable Cavanaugh's office suddenly jangles, and the voice of Tom Dugas informs him that there's still no sign of anyone at the Hayden house. Telling Dugas to go back to his place, Cavanaugh immediately wires Sheriff J.C. Hunter in Yuma and notifies him of the developments. The sheriff replies the deputies Jack Livingston and Bob Cowie are on their way to Bouse. Yeah, here it is. 
I guess this knife of mine will do the trick. You can stand on this box and reach it, I think. Yeah, that's it. Now. Yeah, that did it. Now, if you can give me a boost, I'll go through. Hey, wait a minute, Joe. I'm smaller than you are. Let me go in. Maybe that would be better. <laughs> I don't want to get stuck in there. All right, come on. Give me a boost, will you? I can't make much sense out of all this, Constable. Looks like a wild goose chase to me. Well, we'll know in a minute. Find anything, Cowie? No sign of any bodies. Just a pooch here. Hey, wait a minute. What's up? Hey, looks like there's been a pretty thorough job of searching on in here. Everything's been shoved around, drawers all over. Yeah, well, that puts a different light on things. Cowie, see if you can unlock the front door from inside. I want to take a look myself. When Livingston and Cavanaugh enter the house, they find chaos. Strewn all over the front room floor are letters, empty drawers, pieces of clothing with the lining ripped out. Dugas, eager to be of assistance, checks over Hayden's personal things. Finds that Hayden's shotgun, his 44 6 shooter, his overcoat and his hat are not to be found. Gathering his men about him, Deputy Sheriff Livingston analyzes the situation. Boys, it's easy to see that we're up against something pretty serious. There's nothing much we can do until we produce the bodies of Hayden and Hart, or better yet, the fellows who did it. Cowie, you and Kavanaugh might take a look around the grounds to see what you can pick up. I want to get a few more things straightened out here with Dugas. If you find anything, let me know. Right, Sheriff. Come on, Cowie, let's get going. Okay. Now, Dugas, you can help me a lot. First of all, where did Hayden usually leave the notes you speak of when he left? Uh, up on that piece of tin hanging there on the front porch. Come on, I'll show you. You know, he never went away without leaving one, Sheriff. And that's what made me think that there was something funny in the first place. Well, from the looks of things, your suspicions were right. I'm afraid there's plenty wrong here. Yeah. Here you are. See, here on this nail? Yeah. Well, let's take a look behind this tin here. Maybe a note could have slipped out. Ah. Here's a piece of paper. A note? Yeah. Let's see what it says. Gone to Baus. Home tomorrow, maybe. That's signed Hayden. That ain't from Hayden. No? No. I know it ain't. Because he wouldn't say maybe. He was always sure about what he was going to do and when he was going to do it. Anyway, that ain't his right. Well, I guess that cinches it. The house searched, both men missing, and a forged note. Pretty conclusive evidence. Yeah, what are you going to do about it, Sheriff? He'll go back to Bouse and send some telegrams. Meantime, I'll get Cowie to look for tire tracks from the car you say these fellows had. Working against time, realizing that every second counts, Livingston leaves Cowie to check tire tracks while he, Cavanaugh, and Dugas hurry back to Baus. There to send out a telegraph description of the car and the three fugitives. This done, he drives on to Yuma to make his report, leaving Dugas in the company of another deputy, George Cartwright, to return to the Hayden house to carry on the search. The next day at the deserted shack, the two men start a minute inspection of the grounds. If those dirty bums wanted to get rid of a couple of bodies, it, it strikes me they'd bury them, Summers. And if they did that, well, there's bound to be some signs of it. Yeah, yeah, all we got to do is to find those signs. It's quite a job with a thousand square miles of desert and mountains to hide them in. Hey, wait a minute. Huh? Look over there. But, uh, say, come on. It's a mound of freshly turned dirt. You think it's... Uh, come on, we'll get a shovel and start digging. If it's what I think it is, we won't have to look any further. And a few minutes later, a shovel, wielded by Cartwright, hits something in the soft earth. A little more digging, and the body of Jack Hayden, the missing prospector, lies before the two men, a shotgun wound in the back of his head. Looking around, Cartwright finds another patch of fresh dirt, unmistakably the final resting place of Hayden's partner, Ralph Hart. The corpus delicti has been established, but the murderers are still missing. Cartwright and Dugas rush to Baus and excitedly tell Constable Cavanaugh of their discovery, who in turn wires Sheriff Hunter in Yuma and asks that men be sent out at once to hold an autopsy and carry on the investigation. Within 12 hours, under Sheriff Ingalls, in company with Deputies Livingston, Robinson, and Dr. Reese, Yuma County physician, arrive in Baus, pick up Cavanaugh, and proceed to the scene of the murder. An autopsy of the body discloses that both Hayden and Hart died of gunshot wounds. Hayden, by a blast in the back of the head, 
arced by two rounds, one in the right shoulder blade and one in the mouth. Next day, Livingston reports to the sheriff in Yuma. Well, what's the first thing? I'm not just sure, but I've got a mighty good idea that those three fellows will try to peddle the guns they stole from Hayden the first chance they get. Now, obviously, our first move is to notify all establishments in the state that might buy guns. Tell them to be on the lookout for anything answering the description of the missing ones. You'd better get on that right away, Ingalls. All right. I'm hoping to get some answers from the descriptions I sent out of the getaway car. The since they couldn't have had time to get very far before the description was out. If they try to get out of the state in that car, we'll have them. Yeah. If they don't ditch the car and steal another one, that's what I'm afraid of. Wait a minute. I'll see what this is. Hello? This is Deputy Georges, the Phoenix Sheriff's Office. Oh, yeah. Yeah, what's up, Georges? We just received word from a fellow here in Phoenix that he bought the Chevrolet Roadster and some guns from three men answering your description on that Hayden case. Good. You got this fellow there? Uh, yes. His name is Davenport. Says he knows where these guys were heading for. No, oh, what a break. Go on, go on, Georges. I'm listening. I hear them saying something about running the cash for bus tickets, and he's pretty sure he heard them mention two. Great. See if you can dig up anything else on it, and I'll get in touch with Tucson immediately. If they did go there, we'll undoubtedly be able to find someone who saw them. I'll check with you later. Swell, and thanks a million, Georges. This is a real help. Okay, goodbye. Goodbye. With lightning-like speed, Sheriff Livingston checks with the Tucson police. Receives word that three men answering the description had left the bus at Tucson and transferred to a stage bound for New York City. On the strength of this news, the New York police are notified and requested to be on the lookout for the killers. And three days later, a telegraph message flashes 3,000 miles across the continent to Sheriff Hunter, Yuma, Arizona. Have two of three suspects in custody. Admit to names Doughty and O'Connell. Third suspect's whereabouts unknown. Can you find address Douglas's wife here? If so, please notify us. Chief of Police, New York City. Chief of Police, New York City. Have located Lou Douglas's brother. Says last known address, Mrs. Douglas, 58 East 125th Street, New York City. Appreciate your cooperation. Signed, Sheriff Hunter, Yuma, Arizona. And in response to this message, Detective Maloney of the New York Detective Force, in company with two officers, stop outside the door of a room at 58 East 125th Street, New York. We don't want to take any chance with this lad if he's still here. I'll go in first, and if he starts anything, let him have it. Right. Okay, here goes. Yeah? Is Mr. Lou Douglas living here? What's it to you? Well, nothing much. I I just wanted to have a little talk with him if he was around, that's all. Well, he don't live here anymore, so you might as well scram. Yes, I suppose so. Well, uh... Stop that gun, Douglas. Stop it, I say. <coughs> Uh, here's a nice pair of bracelets for you. Uh, yeah, that's better now. So you thought you'd let us have a slug or two, eh, Douglas? What's this all about anyway? I haven't done nothing and my name's not Douglas. I know, I know. Your name's John Smith and you want to see your attorney. All right, boys. Let's take Mr. Smith for a little tour of the tombs. Once lodged in the city jail, the man denies any knowledge of the crime, denies he is Lou Douglas, denies everything, but he is quickly identified. And when confronted with the proofs, admits he is Douglas, but claims he is innocent of any crime. Notified of his arrest, Sheriff Hunter obtains extradition papers, proceeds at once to New York, and with the three men in his custody, returns to the Yuma County Jail. They are placed in separate cells and not allowed to communicate with one another. And it is while they are locked in their individual cells that they make the biggest mistake... A mistake that brings a trustee to Sheriff Hunter's office with news. What is it, Neil? I thought you'd want to see this note, Sheriff. Note? Yes, sir. It's from one of those three fellows mixed up in that Hayden murder. Oh, all right, let me have it. Yes, sir. Hmm. From Douglas, huh? <laughs> say, say, he says, say, Bill, you must say at the trial that I acted awfully crazy on the day of the murder. I will do all I can for you. And it's signed Lou. Yeah. Very interesting. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if this little piece of paper wouldn't hang the man who wrote it. And on the morning of September 18th, 1933, Lou Douglas, Willard Doughty, and Dan O'Connell faced the angry mob in the crowded Yuma courtroom to stand trial on a murder charge. As a result of the incriminating note he had written, Douglas changes his plea to guilty but claims he acted in self-defense. 
However, the jurors are not swayed by this resort, and on the fifth day of October, less than a month after the trial had begun... Lou Douglas, you have been found guilty of first-degree murder. Have you anything to say before I sentence you? It was self-defense. Lou Douglas, after hearing the evidence offered in this case, it is the belief of this court that you are guilty of deliberately murdering two men. Therefore... It is my duty to sentence you to be executed in the lethal chamber at the state prison in Florence. And may God have mercy on your soul. No, Judge, it ain't right. You can't gas me. You can't do it. Remove the prisoner, Bailey. I didn't do it. It was self-defense. You can't gas a guy for that. It ain't right. Willard Doughty and Dan O'Connell, you have been found guilty of murder in the second degree. Do you wish to make any statement before this course passes sentence on you? No, sir. No. Very well. Because of certain evidence submitted that shows that you, O'Connell, were the least guilty of this crime, I sentence you to five years in the Florence Penitentiary. And may this serve to teach you the futility of trying to break the law. Willard Doughty, I'm going to be more severe with you. You're a menace to society and deserve worse than I can give you. However... It is the sentence of this court that you shall spend the next 25 years of your life in confinement at Florence Penitentiary. Arizona leads all the states in per capita consumption of Rio Grande cracked gasoline. Arizonians have learned that Rio Grande's patented cracking process produces a gasoline that gives greater power, speed, and mileage than other brands selling at the same price. And in driving their engines at high speeds over long distances in desert heat, Arizonians have learned that there is one motor oil which never breaks down. That's Sinclair motor oil. And you can get it in tamper-proof cans wherever Rio Grande cracked gasoline is sold. Because all wax and petroleum jelly is extracted from Sinclair motor oils, they never get thin or watery at high speeds or blistering heat. Your car won't use so much oil when it runs on Sinclair because the parts that burn into carbon so easily are already removed. You get a really pure oil that never fails to give adequate lubrication. This month, we especially want everyone to go into a Rio Grande station and ask for a copy of the new double-size Calling All Cars News. You'll enjoy reading the true detective mysteries, the police, movie, and radio news. And every boy and girl will want to read about Rio Grande's junior police department and the 15 valuable free gifts. Ask for your free copy wherever Rio Grande cracked gasoline is sold. Attention all Yuma County Sheriff's cars. A cancellation broadcast 133. Suspects in this case are now in the penitentiary. That's all. Narrator Frederick Lindsley, bidding you good night for the. Calling all cars, a copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Los Angeles Police calling all cars. Attention, all cars. Broadcast 134. On the new hall grade, a dead body in a trunk. And that's all, Rose and Quest. Every shriek of a siren is a living advertisement for Rio Grande cracked gasoline. Thousands of times a day a siren screams and pedestrians and motorists get out of the way while a police car roars by or a fire engine or an ambulance or a motorcycle. Every second counts when the siren's screaming. So the cities and counties that operate these emergency motors pick the fastest gasoline that they can find. 
the most convincing proof of the all-around superiority of Rio Grande cracked gasoline is the indisputable fact that wherever it is sold, it is specified for more emergency cars than any other brand. How do you choose your gasoline? Do you just buy any gasoline at the most convenient station? Or have you discovered that by driving into the independent Rio Grande station near you, you can get Rio Grande cracked gasoline? The same gasoline that is specified for the finest, fastest, most powerful emergency engines at no extra cost. Then, when a siren screams and when a police car roars past, you will thrill with the knowledge that whenever an emergency arises, you can get police car performance from your own car. It is our pleasure to present Chief James E. Davis of the Los Angeles Police Department. Chief Davis. Good evening, friends. The case you are about to hear dramatized differs from the average police case in that we had no inkling of a missing person or the fact that a crime had been committed until the murderer confessed. It may strike you that as a result, there was no work for the police to do. I hope that the story you are about to hear will convey to you how much work there always is for your police to do before they can call even a voluntarily confessed crime closed. Regardless of the emphasis with which a conscience-stricken murderer may confess, there is always a chance for something to go wrong before the case goes to court or while it is being tried. It is the duty of your police, beyond actually making the arrest of a criminal, so completely to investigate every angle of the case that the prosecution may be provided with an airtight case which no amount of legal acrobatics by the defense attorney can break down. Such was the work done by your police in this amazing affair of the woman with a heart of stone. It was a warm evening in April of 1924. High above the surf-swept beach, an automobile comes to a stop on a lonely promontory on the Santa Monica Palisades. The occupants of the car are Mrs. Margaret Willis and her companion, Bert Webster. Webster flicks off the lights, the better to enjoy the lonely beauty of the ocean. He turns to Mrs. Wallace. Beautiful, isn't it, Margaret? Beautiful. Terrible, Bert. I can't look at it. You can't look at it? No. Say, what's the matter with you? Bert, don't let's stay here. Let's go on. I don't want to stay here. Well, I can't figure you out. You're always showing me a picture of an ocean or something and saying, isn't it beautiful? Now when I ask you the same thing about the real good, you tell me you can't stand to look at it. I can't figure it out. You don't have to figure anything out, Bert. Just please, let's go on. Okay, we're going. What's the matter, Margaret? Have I done something that's made you sore at me? No, you haven't done anything. And please, Bert, don't talk. I'm not in the mood for it. Well, but what... Oh, well, all right. Where are we going, Bert? Where do you suppose? Home, of course. You don't want to look at anything. You don't feel in the mood to talk. What else is there to do? I'd like to drive out to San Fernando. Out to San Fernando? Yes. Say, what's got into you? I'm not out for a tour of the country tonight. I'm tired. I know, Bert. So am I. But I want to drive out there just the same. Well, I don't know whether you're crazy or what, but I'm not going to do any such thing. I worked hard all day, and I need some rest. All right. Then I guess I'll have to tell you. Tell me what? It's about... It's... Well, go on. What the devil are you driving at? Bert, it's about Dr. Baldwin. Well, what about him? Remember I told you that his wife thought he was in Tijuana? Yes. Well, he isn't. Well, what of it? Where is he? He's in that trunk back there. Uh, is this your idea of a joke? No. It's a fact. He's in that trunk you helped me to tie on the back of this car. sure you want to go through with this, Peg? If what you've told me is true, you'd have a good chance of proving yourself innocent if you gave yourself up now before it's too late. Everything I've said is true, Bert. 
I'm afraid to face the police. It was self-defense. He tried to attack me and I... Well, I lost my head and shot him. I can't go back there. I can't do it. All right. I understand. And you will help me, Bert. You won't tell anyone? No, I won't, but I'm scared, Peg. I'm scared stiff. How much farther is it? Only a little ways. We can stop on the New Hall grade, I think. Then hurry. Please hurry. There's the start of the grade right ahead of us. As soon as I see a good place, I'll stop. You've got to be awfully careful, Bert. Suppose someone should see us. That's the chance we take. We'd be arrested. I'd have to go back and answer questions. No one would believe me. There's a spot just ahead there. Do you see any car lights behind? No. No, I don't think so. Then this is it. Nobody in sight. Let's hurry. Can you untie the knots all right? I think so. Yeah. Yeah, there they are. Now help me lift the trunk off the rack. There. Now can you lift up your end? Yes. I've got it. All right. Get it up on top of this guardrail. All right. A little further. There. Hurry, Bert. Oh, hurry. Look over the side and see if it's clear below. We don't want this to hang in some trees. And there's nothing to stop it. Then here it goes. Now, let's get out of here. Bert, what if it can be seen from the road in the daylight? I, I don't know. Only let's go. I'm going down there and look. I can't leave until I know it's completely hidden. But, Peg... You drive on up the grade and turn around. I'm going to hear it as soon as I can get back up. Go on, before someone comes. You're making a mistake, Peg, a bad mistake. Go on. All right. Please. I'll, I'll be right back. to get away. Bert! Bert! Oh, Bert! Thank God it's you. Hurry up. Oh, Bert. It's a terrible mess down there. I'm going to give myself up. I'm going to give myself up. Seven o'clock the following morning in the office of Detective Lieutenant Paul Stevens of the Los Angeles Homicide Squad. Morning, Lieutenant Sergeant. Anything exciting today? I'm afraid not, Lieutenant. Nothing more than a dame. A dame? You mean a woman, don't you, Sergeant? Well, woman or dame, whatever she is, she's been sitting in your office there since six o'clock this morning. So she's got to see you. All right, Sergeant. That's the best you can offer. I'll go in and see what her trouble is. And don't forget, Sergeant, it isn't polite to call women dames. <laughs> Wait till you see her. You'll know what I mean. Good morning. Lieutenant Stevens. That's me. I've been waiting to see you, Lieutenant. I've killed a man. You what? I've killed a man. Well, that's quite a statement. Suppose you tell me who the man is. He was Dr. Benjamin Baldwin. He was drunk and tried to attack me. Would you mind telling me your name? Mrs. Margaret Willis. Thank you, Mrs. Willis. Now, where and when did you kill this man? Friday morning, in my apartment at 1008 West 11th Street. Mm, I see. And where is Dr. Baldwin's body now? I can lead you to it. But first, Lieutenant, I want you to see these. Mm, bruises on your arms. Yes, bruises made when he grabbed me and tried to attack me. I wanted you to see them. For uh, future reference, eh? Organizing a party of seven men, including Inspector Dwight Langevin and Captain John Edwards, both of the detective division, Lieutenant Stevens leads the way to a police car and starts the long drive out to the New Hall grade. There's little conversation as the fast car roars along the highway, leaves the city limits, drops mile after mile behind it. A little more than two hours after leaving Los Angeles, the confessed killer suddenly points to a spot at the side of the road. There. There's the place. All right, Blackwell. Pull up here and stop. Yes, sir. 
Now, Mrs. Willis. It's down there. Come on, boys. Down the hill. You too, Mrs. Willis. There he is. Pretty, isn't it? Mm. He's dead, all right. Got a bullet hole in his head. The buckler? Yes, sir. Take this conversation. Right. And Mrs. Willis, do you positively identify this body? I do. It is Dr. Benjamin Baldwin. Whose trunk is this? Mine. How'd you get the body out here? I brought it out in a car. I have a friend who drives. He and I came out here last night. Do you own a car, Mrs. Willis? I do now, yes. I bought Dr. Baldwin's car. You bought... Hey, do you mean to tell me you drove Dr. Baldwin out here in his own car? In my car. It wasn't his any longer. I had the registration slip in my pocketbook. He turned it over to me. I see. Well, I'll, I'll take that if you don't mind. Now, just when did you buy the car, Mrs. Willis? Friday. Oh, no. No, it was, it was Thursday, I believe. Yes, yes, Thursday. And when did you say you killed this man? Friday morning. He came to deliver the car on Friday, and he was, he was very drunk. Had you paid him for the car in full? Yes, I paid him in full. I saw him put the money in his breast pocket. I'll swear to that. Is the money still in his pocket, Mrs. Willis? No. Well, that is, I don't know whether it is or not. I gave it to him on Thursday. Mrs. Willis, who is this, uh, this friend that drove you out here? Well... Well, now, you might as well tell us. It won't do him any good if you, do, if you lie about it. His name's Bert Webster. Did you get that, Sergeant? Yes, sir. Good. Tell us about him, Mrs. Willis. Well, I, I've known him for five years. Mrs. Willis, are you Webster's common-law wife? Uh, I'm not now, no. I see. And this Webster helped you put Baldwin's body in this trunk? Certainly not. He knew nothing about it. I put it there myself. He was a pretty heavy man, Mrs. Willis. And I'm a very strong woman. I tell you, I put the body in this trunk all by myself. May I see your right hand a moment? Why, certainly. Thank you. Mm. You don't use that hand very much, do you? Why, no. Well, that is, not as much as my other one. I notice it's smaller than your left hand. Yes, I had an accident years ago. It was crushed in a washing machine. Then how did you get that trunk onto the back of your car? Ah, uh, Bert helped me. Oh, then he knew about this all the time. He didn't. I told him it was filled with old books and files that I was going to move to a new office I had rented. He didn't know anything about it. Then how do you explain the fact that he helped you to throw this trunk over this cliff? I told him about it. After we got out here, I made him help me. When was this? It was last night, I think. Yes, yes, it was last night. After we had driven out here. And he didn't know anything about the contents of the trunk until you reached this spot? No, he didn't. Well, I'm thinking we'd better get back to town and find this Bert Webster, Stevens. He ought to have a lot of interesting things to tell us. Returning to Los Angeles, Lieutenant Stevens and Inspector Langevin first assigned two detectives the unpleasant task of notifying Mrs. Baldwin of her husband's death. Then instruct another to bring in Webster for questioning. This done, they retire to Langevin's office. Well, Dwight, what do you make of it? Mm, there's something missing in the picture. That woman's leaving a lot of things out of her answers. Do you suppose this Webster fellow is in on the deal? It looks like it. Well, somehow, the idea of his driving her out there, helping her get rid of the trunk and all that, and not having something to do with it, well, it just doesn't jive. I'm mighty anxious to ask him a lot of questions. Eh, the thing I can't understand is why Mrs. Willis went to all the trouble of getting rid of the body, then walked in and told us about it. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. I'm not so sure about that, Paul. It makes a lot of sense if you figure things out another way. Shoot. Well... Well, just supposing she meant to bump this doctor off and get rid of him. Well, she goes through with it, gets him into the trunk, gets this Webster to drive her out in the valley and dumps the trunk. And the trunk inconveniently spills its occupant out on the ground for all the world to see. Then what? Well, being a woman, she hasn't the nerve to put it back in the trunk. So she figures out that a confession will help her self-defense story. Sure, but it still doesn't explain why, if it was self-defense... She went to all the trouble of making it look like a murder. Yeah. Well, the answer is most likely because it was murder. Now we agree. Come in. Captain Edwards is here with that Webster fellow, Lieutenant. Good. Send him in, Sergeant. Yes, sir. We'll probably know a lot more in a minute or so. I hope. Right in here, Webster. Come in, Captain. This is Bert Webster, Inspector. Inspector Langevin and Lieutenant Stevens. Glad to know you. 
Sit down, Mr. Webster. We'll make this as short as possible. I presume you know why you're here, Mr. Webster. I guess I do, all right. I figured you'd be out for me before long. I want you to answer a few questions. And I want you to think very carefully before you answer us. Yes, sir. First of all, what do you know about this? Well, not a whole lot. I guess you already know more than I do if you've talked to Peg. Who is Peg? Oh, I forgot you didn't know. That's the name I call Mrs. Willis by. Hmm. Sort of a pet name, eh? I guess so. When did you first learn that Mrs. Willis had killed Baldwin? Last night. When last night? Well, I don't know exactly what time it was, but it was when we were driving in from the beach. Did she tell you about it before you drove out to the place where you helped her dispose of it? Yes, sir. She told me about it when I refused to drive her to San Fernando. She said that she'd done it to protect her honor and asked me to help her. Didn't you realize that you were aiding a criminal in the act of committing a crime? It had already been committed. Perhaps the murder had been committed, but it's a crime to help dispose of the body. Don't you know that? Well, yes, sir. I guess I do. You realize you're in a pretty tough spot, don't you, Webster? Yes, sir. Only I didn't have anything to do with the actual killing. Well, that remains to be seen. However, I... I'm inclined to believe that you're telling the truth. I am, Lieutenant. Honest, I am. But until such time as we can prove it one way or another... I'm afraid we'll have to book you as a material witness. You mean I've got to stay in jail? That's right. And while you're there, if you remember any additional things you think we might be interested in, just tell the guard. he let us know about it. They tell me that an honest confession is good for the soul. Locking up the bewildered Webster for further questioning, Langevin and Stevens drive to the home of Dr. Baldwin's widow. Now, Mrs. Baldwin, we realize that this is a terrible experience for you, but under the circumstances, we must ask you some questions. Of course. I understand. I will tell you all I can. Thank you. First of all, had Dr. Baldwin mentioned selling his car? Yes, he discussed it with me several times. He was going to sell it to Mrs. Willis? Yes. Can you remember anything about the last few days that might be of interest to us? Well, well, there were several things that seemed strange to me. But at the time, I didn't realize that there were anything that would lead to this. Easy now, Mrs. Baldwin. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. I'm all right now. What were these things that you speak of, Mrs. Baldwin? Well... Thursday night, we had dinner with some friends, and the subject of the car came up. I suggested that, that the doctor call Mrs. Willis and see if she was ready to buy it. And did he? Yes, he did. I stood right beside him, and I heard him say, All right, that's fine. I'm glad you got it. I'll be over in the morning to deliver the car. By it, I suppose he meant the money. That's what I thought. Anyway, the next morning, Friday... He left the house early to deliver the car and get the money. You're sure it was Friday, not Thursday? Positive. Go on, Mrs. Baldwin. Well, the doctor's office hours were from 2 to 5. And at 3 o'clock, his nurse telephoned me and asked if I knew when he was coming in because his patients were getting tired of waiting for him. He hadn't been to the office at all? No. So naturally, I called Mrs. Willis. Well, what did she tell you? She said that he had been there early that morning and delivered the car and then left. I remember that I asked her if she'd bought the car and... She replied that she had. I asked her how much she had paid for it, and she said, I paid him $750 cash yesterday. That would be Thursday. Yes. But I knew that she couldn't have because I heard him talk to her on the phone Thursday night, as I told you. And she hadn't paid him anything for it then. What happened then, Mrs. Baldwin? I asked her why, if she'd bought it the day before, the doctor had driven it home Thursday night. What'd she say to that? Well, that he'd said he needed the car the next day, and she'd let him have it. And... Well, then she said something very queer, Lieutenant. What was that, Mrs. Baldwin? Well, she asked me if my husband was a drinking man. And when I said no, she, she said that it was funny. Because when he delivered the car that morning, he left his grips in it. And that he promised to come back later in the morning and give her another driving lesson. But that he hadn't. And this was in the afternoon? Yes. And... Oh, and then she told me something that just didn't seem possible. She said that she didn't think he was coming back to me. That he mentioned going to Mexico and... And leaving me. Have you and Dr. Baldwin had any quarrel that might lead him to leave you? Certainly not. We were happy. For the next seven days, the two detectives devote their entire time to questioning witnesses, breaking down Margaret Willis's self-defense story, 
And at the end of this time, they are in possession of these damaging facts. First, Mrs. Willis claims that Baldwin was drunk the day of the murder. A close acquaintance of his swears that he saw and talked to the doctor as late as 10 o'clock on Friday morning, that he had not been drinking. And second, an employee of the Percival Arms Apartments informs police that on the morning of the murder, he delivered the trunk empty to the Willis apartment, and that when he was about to leave, he saw a man's shoe protruding from a hall closet, that although it looked like there might be a foot in it, he hadn't said anything until he read of the murder in the papers. From several neighbors of Margaret Willis, it is learned that she is a woman of great strength and possesses an insane temper when angry. And at last, after several weeks of preparation, Margaret Willis is placed on trial for her life before Judge Charles Craig in the Los Angeles Superior Court. Several preliminary witnesses are heard, and then the court crowded to capacity with eager throngs craning for a look at the now famous woman. Deputy District Attorney Hammer calls Margaret Willis to the stand. Mrs. Willis, you realize that you're under oath, that you're sworn to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Very well. Now, you say that on Friday morning, April 12th of this year, the deceased came to your house to deliver a car that you had purchased the day before for $750. That is right. And isn't it a fact that in reality you'd not paid this man a dollar yet? I object, Your Honor. Incompetence irrelevant in the material. Objection sustained. Very well. Mrs. Willis, would you mind telling me exactly what took place in your apartment on the morning in question? Just tell me in your own words. Well, Dr. Baldwin brought the car over about 8 o'clock. And he was drunk. I object. Overruled. Come. Proceed, please. He said, Lord, I love you this morning. And I asked him if he was drunk, and he said, maybe. Then what happened, Mrs. Willis? Well, he was going to give me a driving lesson, so I went to the closet to get a coat. And suddenly he came up behind me and tried to kiss me. Continue, please. When he tried to kiss you, what did you do? I tried to get away from him, and he grabbed me. I told him not to be so silly to go out to the car, that I'd be right out. Did he go? Yes. At least I thought he'd gone. But when I came out of the closet, I found him standing there. He's looking drunker every minute. So what did you do then? I told him to please go, and he started toward me. So I backed into the closet and grabbed the gun that I always kept there. What kind of a gun, Mrs. Willis? A revolver. Is this gun marked People's Exhibit Number 2, the one, Mrs. Willis? Yes, that is the one. Thank you. You may continue. Well, I told him to leave or I'd shoot him. But he didn't. He grabbed me by the arm. With you holding the gun pointed at him? Yes. Why didn't you call for help? There were neighbors all around. Why, well, I didn't want any notoriety. Yet you'd rather shoot a man than have a little notoriety? I, I didn't think about that. You didn't think about his wife or his baby either, did you? I object, Your Honor. The question is leading and suggested. Objection overruled. Mrs. Willis, tell us in your own words just what happened from the point where he grabbed you by the arms to the actual shooting. We struggled a bit, and then I fell down with him still holding me. Suddenly, well, I guess I got scared because I saw his head right in front of the gun and I pulled the trigger. Did he die instantly? I... I guess so. Your Honor, my client doesn't know what she's saying. I can prove that she didn't even fire the shot that killed the deceased. It was her lover, Bert Webster, who killed him. <laughs> the court will be quiet or I will clear it. Mr. Laws, you've just made a serious accusation. Can you offer evidence to this court confirming it? I can, Your Honor, and I will. I can produce positive proof that Bert Webster was the killer of Dr. Baldwin. And before this trial is over, I will. But the defense attorney's statements proved to be no more than a last-minute desperate attempt to bring a retrial. And after reviewing the facts, Judge Crail submits the case to the jury. And in the press room... Yeah, I tell you, she'll get out of it. All it takes is a dame and a smart attorney, and it's a setup. You might be right, Ed. I never saw it to fail. Doesn't matter whether she's young or old, the jury will fall for the old gag about you can't hang a woman. I wouldn't be surprised to see her get off with ten years, suspended. Yeah. Well, all I can say is if she does, there ain't no justice. <laughs> Jury reached a verdict. Uh, we have, Your Honor. Will the clerk of the court read it, please? We, the jury, 
find the defendant guilty of murder is the first degree. Is there any reason why this court should not pass sentence at this time? No, Your Honor. Very well. Margaret Willis, stand and face the court. You have been found guilty of murder in the first degree. <coughs> Therefore, it is the verdict of this court that you shall be confined to the state penitentiary for the duration of your natural life. <sighs> <laughs> Margaret Willis, murderess, was sent to the penitentiary for life, there to pay the penalty for her crime, a strange crime, this inasmuch as it was definitely proved that self-defense was not the reason for the murder. The only other reason was the desire to own Dr. Baldwin's automobile. It seems incredible that anyone, in possession of their full senses, could resort to murder for so small a gain, yet such was the fact in this fiction-like case. Thank you, Chief Davis. Photographs of Mrs. Willis' trunk murder case and the complete story of the amazing crime you have just heard are printed in the fascinating Calling All Cars News, a bigger and better publication this month than ever before, with several true detective mysteries, latest radio and, and movie news, and descriptions of 14 gifts that Rio Grande offers free to every boy and girl. Get your free copy of the news wherever Rio Grande cracked gasoline is sold. This is the same gasoline used by many of the largest law enforcement agencies in the West. Rio Grande cracked gasoline speeds the police cars of many cities and counties to a speedier solution of the crime mysteries that you hear on this program. The same qualities that have caused this gasoline to be chosen to power more emergency cars than any other brand are needed by your car to develop its maximum speed and power. Give your car a chance with Rio Grande cracked to show you some real police car performance. But when you're enjoying this greater speed and power, be sure that your engine is protected by motor oil that won't break down at high speeds. Rio Grande dealers recommend Sinclair motor oils because they are guaranteed to provide a thinner but tougher film of protection that never breaks down at any speed. You use less oil when you fill your crankcase with Sinclair motor oils because the wax, jelly, and carbon-forming impurities are already extracted. Sinclair Motor Oil makes the ideal running mate for Rio Grande cracked gasoline. Los Angeles Police calling all cars, attention all cars, a cancellation broadcast 134 regarding a dead body found on Newhall Grade. The body has been identified and suspect this case is now in custody. That's all. Rose and Quist. Your narrator, Gary Breckner, bidding you good night for the Rio Grande Oil Company. Calling All Cars, a copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Sacramento Police, calling all cars, attention all cars, broadcast 135. You are instructed to cooperate with Sergeant Cox of the narcotic detail in locating the source of supply of marijuana now being unloaded in Sacramento. That's all. <laughs> most powerful motor cars on the road today are emergency cars, the police cars that answer your call for help, the fire engines that thunder through crowded streets at top speed, the ambulances that rush to the rescue of injured persons. No city or county tries to economize on the gasoline for these emergency cars. They want the best gasoline that money can buy, and they specify Rio Grande cracked gasoline more than any other brand wherever it is sold. Yet, surprising as it may seem, 
the cost of Rio Grande cracked gasoline is no higher than ordinary brands that lack the outstanding speed and power of cracked. All extra features of greater speed, greater power, faster acceleration are just extra values that Rio Grande gives you. Now you can use the same gasoline that has powered the emergency cars of Los Angeles, Oakland, Berkeley, Fresno, Merced, San Diego County, and Maricopa County in Arizona, and many, many others. Drive into the independent service station in your neighborhood that features Rio Grande cracked gasoline and Sinclair motor oil. Ask for a tankful of Rio Grande cracked gasoline, and you'll quickly realize the extra value that has made this gasoline so successful. It costs no more to get police car performance in your own car. And now we are privileged to present Chief W.M. Hellinan of Sacramento Police Department, who will speak to you from the new studios of Station KFBK in Sacramento. Chief Hellinan. Good evening. The case you are about to hear tonight, although from the files of my department, is really not my case. It is the case of Ed Cox, sergeant in charge of the narcotic detail of the Sacramento Police Department. This broadcast, in fact, might be considered a tribute to Sergeant Cox, who for more than 20 years have been an explanatory police officer. Sergeant Cox is an internationally recognized authority on narcotic criminology. He adds to his extraordinary zeal as a police officer a true crusading spirit against the drug traffic. For years he has fought it with all the powers legally vested in him, and he goes further than the line of duty, for he carries on an incessant campaign for narcotic control all over the United States, agitating for adequate legislation campaigning for wider public education to the dangers of narcotics. It is a great pleasure for me to be able publicly to command Sergeant Cox for a splendid work. March 14, 1934, in a dimly lit side street in Sacramento, two shadowy figures meet. I'll show you. Where are smoke is, Jose? You have the marijuana for me? You have the money? See, si. five dollars. Here. Bueno. And here is your marijuana. Okay, boys, stick them up. Yeah, what do you say? What is it? You You're know? under arrest, two ears. We've been watching you for a couple of weeks, waiting until you'd make a sale. Shake him down, Thomas. All right. Yeah, but, senor, I did Save do... your breath, Garcia. You know better. We got you in the act of a sale, and you can't talk your way out of it. Come on, pile in the car here. You better drive, Thomas. Okay. Senor, if you will permit a question. Yeah? This Jose, you do not arrest him? Jose? Huh? I should say not. He works for us. Come on, get in. You get in the front seat with Thomas, Jose. Okay, Sergeant. Now, uh, what I want to know, Chew Ears, is where did you get that marijuana? I do not know. Oh, come on, Chew Ears. That's pretty weak. Where did you get it? From a Mexican fellow. What was his name? I do not know. Oh, yes, you do. Believe me, senor, I do not know a Mexican fellow's name. What does he look like? Well, he looked like any other Mexican fellow. Now, listen, Chew Ears, quit the stalling. Well, he was like any other Mexican fellow, except he had warts on his hands. May 10th, 1934, Sergeant Cox and his partner, Detective W.A. Thomas, working day and night to stem the rapidly rising flow of marijuana cigarettes into Sacramento, raid a rooming house near the river. Stay where you are. Get away from that gun. These cops will keep any funny ideas out of your head. But, senor, what have I done? Who are you? You know both answers. Hmm. Looks like he's got enough marijuana here to make a couple of thousand cigarettes, eh? Yeah. 
What's your name? Joe Ramirez. Where did you get this marijuana? I cannot say. You'd better say. I would be killed, and besides, I, I do not know. What do you mean, you don't know? I do not know. You married? See. Si. You got any kids? See. Si. Two. Mm. It's going to be tough on them when we put you away for a nice long sleep up in Quentin. Where are they going to live on? I can't save. Well, if you're smart, you'll help us out. Where did you get this marijuana? Mexican fellow. What Mexican fellow? I do not know. What was his name? Only name I know is Mexican Jim. Mexican Jim, eh? What does he look like? I, I can't, they kill me. I cannot tell you. They can't kill you up in Quentin, and that's where you're going. Now, what did this Mexican Jim look like? Well, he had warts on his hands. Oh, you hear that, Thomas? Yeah. Our man with the warts on his hand is named Mexican Jim. Well, where did he get the stuff, Ramirez? I do not know. But I heard he has the biggest marijuana field in the world. The biggest marijuana field in the world, eh? Where? Where is it? Quien sabe. You better tell us, Ramirez. Por favor, senor, I do not know. It is in California someplace. That is all I heard. But where? There are 58 counties in California. I am sorry, senor. I do not know anymore. For three months, the two officers question every suspect regarding the marijuana field owned by Mexican Jim, the man with warts on his hand. But no one can or will tell where it is. And then, following a raid in August, Jose, the squad's undercover man, excitedly reports to Cox. Yeah, Jose, what's on your mind? Listen, Sergeant, you know that Estrada we brought in on that raid this morning? Yeah. I heard him say in Spanish why we were bringing them over, he said... Mexican Jim over in Yolo has better get that 500 pounds to L.A. before Cox catches him and grabs his field. Mexican Jim. Yolo. Grab his field. You hear that, Thomas? Yeah. That's the break we've been looking for. Not much of a break. Must be several hundred ranches in Yolo County. That's okay. We'll visit them all. Mm, how? Waltz in and ask them if they're growing any marijuana? Of course not. We've got to figure some legitimate excuse to get onto the ranches. Hmm. Well, hey, how about posing as inspectors from the Department of Agriculture? Plant inspectors, eh? Yeah. No, that's no good. We'd get to see the foreman or the owners of the ranches, but that isn't enough. What do you mean? Well, maybe our Mexican Jim is working on one of these ranches as a laborer, growing his marijuana on some unused acreage of his boss. That's possible. The boss might never get wise. It only takes marijuana 90 days to mature. It looks like a weed when it's growing. Yeah, that's right. You see, we've got to figure out some kind of a gag that'll get us among the Mexican ranch hands. Jose. See, si, Sergeant. You worked on some of the ranches around here. You got any ideas how we could get close to the ranch hands? Well, you might sell them something, Sergeant. Sell them something? Well, of course. Jose, you'll go far in this policing business. Gracias, senor. Sell them something. What will we sell them? Well, they, they buy a lot of gin. <laughs> That'd be a nice story. Narcotic officers sell liquor to ranch hands. Might as well go out peddling them reefers. Well, how about books or magazines? No, not enough of them can read. We've got to have a line of goods that will interest them. I've got it. Suits. Suits? Sure. These boys go for flashy clothes. We'll get some samples and some order blanks and go into the clothing business. Well, that sounds reasonable. Sure. And it'll get us close enough to them to watch for warts on the hands. After all, that's our only clue. What do you think, Jose? Will the Mexicans be interested in flashy clothes? Sure they will. But they must not be too expensive. These poor fellows, they have not much money. Don't worry. We'll get a cheap enough line of goods. And you're going to help me pick it out. Gracias, senor. And then you're going along with us to act as interpreter. We may need you, Jose. Next day, equipped with books of swatches, tape measure, and designs, the two officers and their Mexican assistant begin a systematic canvas of the ranches of Yolo County. Day after weary day, they pursue their adopted profession, selling suit after suit, but never managing to meet with a Mexican with warts on his hands. And then, after they have visited nearly 40 ranches, with discouragement has often tempted them to give up their chaotic search, they call upon a ranch not ten miles from Sacramento. The big Italian who owns the place meets them on the porch of the ranch house. Good day, gentlemen. Oh, how do you do? We represent the Western Haberdashery Company, Incorporated. 
We'd like to interest you in a suit of clothes. Uh, not to me. Well, here, just take a look at our line of samples. The latest thing right from New York. No, you've got the Solomino clothes. I've been wearing this suit for ten years. Well, how about the men on the place here? Mm. Mind if we show our line to your hands? Well, look, to tell you the truth, there ain't nobody working for me now. Oh, I thought I noticed a Mexican down by the barn when we drove in. Oh, and him? Well, he don't work for me. He's working a part of the ranch, you know. He's got the 45 acres oh, yeah. uh, on the lease. Think he might be interested in a suit of clothes? I don't know. I won't hurt it to ask him. Hey, will you? Yeah? Come over here. Come, my brother. I want to talk to you. Okay. Yeah. Ah, uh, these fellas are selling suits. You like to look at them? Sure, I don't care. Maybe I need a new suit of clothes. Uh, this is Mr. Penner. And, uh, I didn't catch you. What is the name? Mine's Edwards. Yeah. This is Mr. Smith and Mr. Valentino. How do you do? Red and oil. Well, let's see these suits you're selling. Yes, uh, get out the samples, Valentino. Right away. Thomas, did you see that? He has warts on his hands. Yeah, I noticed it. Here are the samples. Now, Mr. Painter, this is a very popular number. Blue serge is just what they're wearing in New York. Oh, I don't like that. How about these one here, these striped stuff? Oh, an excellent choice. And just look at the models we're showing. Say, you'd look like a fashion plate in this double-breasted model, Mr. Painter. Yeah, I kind of like that. How much it cost to make me a suit like that? Well, we can fix you up with this model for $40. $40? What do you think I am? Oh, of course, we have some others almost as good for as low as 25 I guess we can't do any business, then. Well, the quality is the very best for the money. Listen, my friend. I am not one who pays $40 for a suit of clothes. When I buy clothes, I buy the best. I expect to pay $100 or more for a suit. Oh. I didn't understand you at first. This stuff is too cheap for me. I don't buy junk like these peons wear. Come around sometime when you've got some good stuff. Well, now, just a minute, Mr. Painter. My friend Valentino here has some very fine samples up in Sacramento. You know, it's a pity you didn't bring them along today, isn't it, Valentino? Huh? What? Well, those uh, custom-built suits, that hundred-dollar line you're representing. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I should have brought them. Yes. You see, we didn't expect to encounter a man of your taste, Mr. Painter. Yeah, there ain't many of them around here. But if you could give Valentino an appointment, I'm sure that you'll be pleased with his line. Okay. Well, when shall we say? I'll be up in Sacramento on Sunday. Want to meet me then? When? Where? At Valdez Restaurant. You know the place? Oh, yes, I know it. I will meet you this Sunday, say, at 3 o'clock. Yeah, that'll be okay. Adios, gentlemen. Adios. So long. Who's the bad boy? Hey, he nearly had us with that hundred-dollar line. Yeah, well, I'll bet that's our guy. Warts on the hands, and he's leasing 45 acres from that Italian. Tell me, where am I to get samples of hundred-dollar suits? We'll find them someplace. But that isn't all you'll have for him Sunday. No? What else? Are you going to arrest him? No, not yet. But you'll have a problem that you will uh, have to ask this guy's advice about. Cox instructs Jose to write himself a letter, which is then sent to the San Francisco police for mailing so that it will bear a San Francisco postmark. On Sunday, after Jose and Pena have discussed suits for some time, Jose brings up this pressing problem contained in his letter. I have a problem on my hands. Perhaps you can help me solve it. What is it? I have a letter from a dear friend of mine in San Francisco. I don't know what to do about it. What does the letter say? Here, I will read it to you. It says, My good friend Valentino, do something for me. While you are visiting ranches in the Sacramento Valley, selling sewers to Mexicans... Please keep your eyes and ears open for a good buy of marijuana. Mm, marijuana, huh? Say, I can handle 500 pounds of first-grade merchandise, and I will pay you a nice commission if you can buy it for me at a reasonable price. Mm. I understand there are some wonderful fields in the Sacramento and San Joaquin Valleys. You might try around Modesto. Modesto? Say, I hear there is a fellow down there who has some fine stuff. Mm. With the demand I have from the Alaska fishing boats and the canneries and packers, as well as my San Francisco trade, I feel inclined to invest in 500 pounds 
prices. I think the price is going up. Oh, the price is going up. Make a good deal for me, and I will reward you. Your old friend, Fernando Martinez. You see, Pena, I don't know anything about marijuana. I've got too much to do myself. Hmm. I can't go all the way down to Modesto to look for marijuana for Fernando. But still, I, I don't want to disappoint him. He's a very old friend of mine. You will not have to disappoint him. Valentino, I can supply him with 10,000 pounds of marijuana if necessary, and I will only charge him $5 a pound for it. What? I am indeed fortunate to have met you. You have 10,000 pounds of marijuana on that ranch? No, 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 he's not on the ranch. It is more than 50 miles from Sacramento. This marijuana has never been on that ranch. I have a store at another place. Well, when can I get these 500 pounds from my friend? Mm, it will take at least a week before I can deliver it. He's not fully mature yet. Still, uh, I can tell my friend Fernando that I can get the marijuana for him, huh? You can't tell him that. Oh, my good friend, Pena, you don't know how happy you make me. And oh, yes, Sergeant, another thing. He is known to all the people around Valdez as Mexican Jim. Uh, he's our man, all right. But he was lying to you. What do you mean, Ed? Well, he said the marijuana was stored 50 miles from town. Then he said that it would not be fully matured for a week. Marijuana can't be stored until it's fully matured. Hey, that's right. My hunch is that he gave Jose the runaround because the marijuana is on that ranch. Yeah, I believe you're right, Ed. Yeah, and you remember that Italian told us, Pena, or Mexican Jim, or whatever his name is, is leasing 45 acres. That's probably where the field's located. Then we've got to find the field, first of all. Yeah, and we can't go nosing around there in the daytime. I don't intend to. We're going down there tonight. Oh, and wear some old clothes, Thomas. There's no telling what we may run into. That night, a couple of hours before midnight, Cox and Thomas leave their car parked a mile from the ranch and start their investigation of the Italian's land. It's pretty hard going, for they dare not use a light. Can you tell what this stuff is growing in this field? Yeah, it looks like lettuce, but it's hard to tell with no light. Yeah, we'll cut into the next field then. Yeah. Hmm. Moon's rising. Yeah. When it does, we'll have to scram out of here. What? Oh, what's the matter? I oh, down there fell into that irrigation ditch. Yeah, woke up all the dogs in the car. Well, I can't help it. Can... I'll fix that. Hey, what are you throwing? Some hunks of meat I brought along. It'll keep them occupied. Looks like tomatoes in this field. Yeah. That's corn on the other side there. You can tell by the height. Oh, wait a minute, Ed. Huh? Look at those leaves catching the moonlight. All silver. Yeah. And they're quivering. There's no wind blowing. That's the marijuana field. Look, he's planted corn around the edges to fake it. Huh. Looks as though the marijuana's outgrown the corn. Yeah. Well, we know where the field is now. We'd better get out of here before somebody sees us. Yeah. And it looks like we've got our friend Mexican Jim right where we want him, huh? Oh, no. Not yet. He could beat this evidence in court. Claim that he didn't know what was growing on his land. After all, marijuana's a weed. He could claim it just, just happened to grow there. Well, if we can't let him get away with this... Don't worry, we won't. Tomorrow morning, we'll give Jose another job to do. Okay, let's get out of here, then. Just a minute. Hey, what are you doing? Collecting a few leaves for souvenirs. I want to make a chemical analysis of this stuff. <laughs> you set for me, Sergeant? Yes, Jose. I want you to go out and see your friend, Mexican Jim. Yes? Yeah. We located this field last night, and the chemist reports that the samples we brought in are marijuana, all right. But we don't want any slip-ups. So here's 50 bucks. I want you to buy some marijuana from him. Then we'll have him for possession and sale. I understand. Tell him that your friend in San Francisco wants to buy 10 pounds to sample it before he ties up a lot of money and 500 pounds. He'll fall for it. Okay. And report back to me as soon as you've made the arrangements. Yes, sir. Jose interviews Mexican Jim at his ranch and the deal's set he returns to headquarters and reports to Sergeant Cox and Detective Thomas everything is arranged Sergeant when will he make delivery he told me to be outside a hamburger joint in Dixon at one o'clock in the morning and he would bring the marijuana to me Dixon that's 15 miles from the ranch isn't it Thomas yeah just about that guy Pena's too smart to deliver the stuff himself. He'll probably hide it somewhere between the ranch and Dixon. 
So there's no chance of being caught in the act of actual sale. Yeah, I wouldn't be the least bit surprised. Well, just to make sure, Thomas, you and I will go out to his ranch as soon as it gets dark. And Jose, you go to Dixon and wait for him. But the chances are he won't meet you. The chances are he'll be in jail by one o'clock in the morning. Shortly after sundown that night, Cox and Thomas pulled their car off the road into the little lane leading to the ranch house. A tense couple of hours pass, and then they hear an automobile start from the ranch. Okay, Thomas, roll it across the road. I'll stay back here where he can't recognize me. Hey, what's the idea of locking the road? This is private property. Well, I'm awfully sorry, brother, but the car broke down. I wonder if you could give us a hand to push it out of the way, huh? Well, okay. Go on, Joe. All right, do we push him. All right, boys, up with your hands. Uh, what, what, uh, what is it, this hijack? No, an arrest. Thomas, huh? slap the bracelets on these two. Arrest? For what? Suspicion of possession of narcotics at the moment. Say, haven't I seen you before? Yeah. I tried to sell you a suit. Now I'm going to buy you one. A gray one with a number on it. Here's what we're looking for, Thomas. A ten-pound can of marijuana. Pena and his lieutenant, an Italian named Joe Saldi, are placed in jail. And the following morning, Cox and Thomas return to the field to view their capture for the first time in daylight. With them is a professor from the California College of Agriculture. Well, what do you think of it, Professor? I wouldn't have believed it. It's the most scientifically grown field of anything I've ever seen. Observe the care with which the soil has been treated and the careful irrigation. Yes, apparently his intention was to mask the marijuana with those rows of corn on the outside. As you see, he failed because the marijuana grew too high. And no wonder... With the care it has been given. What would you estimate the size of the field to be? Oh, about five acres. Five acres? Do you hear that, Thomas? Yeah. Do you realize then, Professor, that this constitutes the biggest marijuana seizure in the history of narcotic enforcement? Indeed. Yes, sir. There's never been anything like it before. Enough marijuana for four million cigarettes. It's a great pity that the man who grew this couldn't have applied his talents to legal agriculture. What a scientific farmer he would have been. Yeah, Professor... The world would be a better place if a lot of smart crooks were spending their time figuring how to help people instead of how to harm them. The Davis marijuana field constitutes such a vast seizure that it is impossible to transport it. Under careful guard, the narcotic is cut down and then burned before it has time to mature. And in the meantime... Cox interviews his prisoner in the Sacramento jail. Well, Pena, looks pretty tough for you. Yeah, what do you mean, tough for me? You haven't got anything on me? Oh, yes, we have. Plenty. What? Well, that field of yours. That ain't my field. You leased it from that Italian. I was growing corn and lettuce and stuff. Well, how do you explain the marijuana? I don't know nothing about it. Loco weed grows wild. Well, not this loco weed. This was planted, irrigated, and raised. And believe me, Pena, it's is a beautiful job. I don't know what you mean. Oh, now listen, man. We've got a half a dozen peddlers we already put away who'll testify that you furnished them with marijuana. If they do, it'll be too bad be for Be careful, Pena. I might use that against you. Huh? Then there's that ten-pound can of marijuana we found in your cart last night. How do you explain that? It belonged to Soldi. Hmm. Now, Pena, you wouldn't think on a pal, would you? That suit salesman, Valentino, he's working for us, you know. And he'll testify about your willingness to take an order for 500 pounds. Okay, okay. I guess you got me all right. Yes, we sure have. Well, what do you want to know? Well, just off the record, I'd like to know how you ever come to play such a long chance. Because I'm a gambler, I guess. I like to live good. Yeah, I like to pay $100 for your clothes, for instance, huh? Yeah, that's part of it. I figured if I went on farming all my life, I'd never clean up. And here was a long shot to play, a chance of getting it all at once. It cost me 28 cents a pound to raise that marijuana, and I would have sold it at $5 a pound. That's profit. Yeah, but you didn't sell it at $5 a pound. All you got out of it is a trip to San Quentin. That's the chance I took, and I lost. Well, didn't the responsibility ever occur to you? Uh, what responsibility? Well, let's say, for instance, 
somebody who smoked a couple of cigarettes made from your marijuana might have gone out and killed somebody. In a way, you would have then been responsible for that murder. That is, ethically, if not legally. I don't look at things like that. I figure that a man who's full enough to smoke marijuana will get into trouble anyway. Oh, then you don't smoke it. Uh -huh. Not me. I'm too smart. Julio Pena, alias Mexican Jim, was smart. A decidedly superior man. But he wasn't smart enough to see the futility of the gamble that he tried to get away with. He lost to the tune of six years in San Quentin, and his partner, Soldi, was deported to Italy. Sergeant Cox received the congratulations of narcotic enforcement agencies all over the world for the excellent work which resulted in the seizure and destruction of the largest field of scientifically grown marijuana ever attempted. you like to ride in a police car. Rio Grande offers you all the thrills and speeds of police car performance in your own car when you use Rio Grande cracked gasoline. The same gasoline that powers more emergency cars than any other brand. You'll be driving faster and further this summer and you don't want to keep stopping to add an extra quart of oil. Fill up once with Sinclair Motor Oil, sold by all Rio Grande dealers you'll find that you can use a lighter grade of oil and have it last longer because Sinclair motor oil is refined until all impurities and non-lubricating substances are removed. It doesn't burn up like most motor oils and you'll actually get more miles for your money with Sinclair. At any Rio Grande station, you can get a free copy of Calling All Cars News that tells you all about these radio programs and also illustrates the complete junior detective outfit that Rio Grande gives away free to all boys and girls. Sacramento police calling all cars, attention all cars, a cancellation broadcast 135 regarding marijuana peddlers' activities. The source of supply has now been destroyed, and that's all. Gary Breckner bidding you good night.